Hello, this is Paul Check. Welcome back to my video blogs. Today I thought I'd talk about a fun topic, something I've been using myself actually since I was uh, a little kid. Um, I've had many experiences with this and the title of our uh, presentation today is A Rabbit with Horns, Active Imagination. Now, we're in an interesting world today where meditation is being talked about probably more than ever through common media streams. And the common theme, particularly in industrialized nations, is that people have a hard time meditating. There's many ideas about what meditation is, and uh, I don't have the time right now to go into all these different ideas. But today what I want to share with you is a technique that I've used extensively in my life and it's helped me to invent things, to solve problems, to solve my own inner challenges and to uh, be creative in my artistic self-expression, my self-expression through movement or exercise. And that process is referred to by Carl Jung as active imagination. Most people in our culture, when you go to meditation classes or read books by meditation teachers of various types, are taught or uh, perceive that meditation means to stop your mind. But there's some challenges that go hand in hand with that, and those challenges and misunderstandings often lead people to give up on meditation or to get frustrated. And to help explain active imagination and then why that relates to meditation, I'll, I'll point out that active imagination is a process of either taking an existing image in your mind or from something in your environment or something that you're working on and then bringing it up inside yourself and interacting with it. Um, in his book, Living Buddha, Living Christ, Thich Nhat Hanh talks about how the Buddhist monks in their training learn these active imagination techniques. And one of them is called the rabbit with horns. And the Buddhist masters that teach the up and coming monks would do things like say, imagine one animal and then find another animal that's very different. So a rabbit and then a big horn sheep, for example, and take something from the big horn sheep and merge it with the rabbit so that you get something unique, such as a rabbit with horns. Now, you can see that that really uses one's imagination. And it's something that we can easily do in our minds. We can create anything we want in our minds. In fact, we regularly in our world today create all sorts of images that are fearful and stressful and that's often the case for people that are suffering from anxiety is they're creating images but largely unconsciously and projecting them into the forefront of their mind and actually believing these thoughts as though they were true which can lead to all sorts of problems and people forget that the mind's function is to think so it's forever thinking so the point I'm making here is that when you hold the idea of trying to stop your mind, you're also making a distinction that your mind is somehow disconnected from the mind of society or the mind of family or the mind of culture or the mind of the world or the mind of the universe or creation itself. So to help you understand this concept, if you take a circle and draw an X in it, and in the middle would represent not only the eye of your own perception, but the ego. You're, I'm looking at the camera right now, you're looking at me through your eye. It's likely that you're going to perceive me as separate from you. And it's easy for me to perceive that camera or even you, as separate from me. But if we look at some of the underlying truths that are, you know, ancient concepts from shamanism, 
um, ancient cultures, the Egyptians, almost all the ancient cultures, especially in the mystery schools, taught things like this and took people through, <clears throat> through initi initiatory ceremonies using various techniques to actually bring a person into a conscious experience of the fact that the so-called separation of I and you or I and thou is actually more of a, an illusion than a reality. So if we look at my circle, the I represents your perceptions, we means you perceiving someone else, i.e. your mother, father, brother, sister, boyfriend, girlfriend, it relates to an object. So if you see a rabbit, it's an it. If you see a stone, it's an it. If you look out and see a mountain, it's an it. It's again perceived as something outside of you. And then we have the all, the, the circle represents totality. So you could say all that could possibly be inclusive of the I, the we, and the its is contained in the circle. The circle is used symbolically because the circle represents something that has no beginning and no end. If you take a line, a piece of string, on one end you have the past, in the middle you have the present, and the other end you have the future, but if you take the end of the past and the end that's called the future and you tie them together and now you have a circle, you no longer have a past or a future, you only have a present. So in order for you, for example, to think I'm talking to Paul, you have to actually take yourself from memory, you have to re retrieve from memory, I'm listening to Paul check, and then put it in the moment, and then it creates I and Paul, but if you had no memory, you'd be in a complete state of now. You'd just be like an, a newborn infant who's one with everything, and the mountain and the rabbit and the stone are experienced as expressions of itself, which is why children are often so enamored with their own hands and their own faces and everything around them often makes them giggle because it's such a surprise. Now if we look at ourselves as the center of things, we can see that there's vibrational realms in reality. So if you kind of think like a rainbow or look at the chakra system, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, which correlates to the frequencies in octave, if you step the light vibration down in octaves to sound, you get do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, which creates shall we say the octave of physical expression and physical perception is within which we normally live. So here we have the physical reality, the emotional or astral. Astral is related to our sense of feeling, often related to our dreaming sense. Mental means the realm of thoughts. Archetypal is the realm from which pure forms emerge. So the archetypal realm you could say could contain the platonic solids which are which uh, philosophically those five solid shapes are the basis of all creation uh, archetypal realms would be things like the archetype of movement um, the archetype of warmth uh, the archetype for example of stars so things that are the archetypal realm at this level contains the basic ideas that are expressed in and as life or the universe itself. And the deeper you go into various types of meditations, or in some cases shamanic journeys, the more you experience each of these realms and can move through them to ultimately get all the way to the causal level and so if you look at what research shows on our consciousness, we have three primary modes of conscious uh, perception. One is called the waking or the gross state. I'm here talking to you, the board's hard. The dreaming state, which I had to use to dream up what I wanted to share with you today. And you can be daydreaming or dreaming at night. Any of those things represent the dreaming state. For example, if you're driving your car and you go through an intersection and you can't remember whether the light was red or green, you're probably happy that you're alive, but your subconscious mind was monitoring the light because you were dreaming. So you were jumping out of the physical state up into the dreaming state, which is one of the things that makes meditation hard is because our mind 
until we learn to manage it tends to jump from the physical state to the dreaming state and then to the causal state which is the point at which you're in deep dreamless sleep and there's no conscious awareness which can change through a meditative practice instead of being unconscious in that state you can become something akin to just pure awareness which is hard to really describe but it's something that can be experienced so when we're dealing with active imagination one of the processes that we're learning is to engage with each of these things not as separate entities but something that we can bring into ourselves. just like you bring a piece of food into you if you eat a strawberry the thing that was perceived to be as outside of yourself is now in you and is part of you so there's strawberriness inside of you and it adds that strawberriness to you so whatever the strawberry brings in its shall we say <clears throat> vibrational reality whether it be the idea the nutrition the energy from the environment the uh, energy in the water all becomes one with you so the strawberry in a sense becomes you but it's easy to separate that from us and think we're pooping the strawberry out or whatever but the reality of it is, is that strawberry merges into you and becomes one with you just like if you drop a dropper uh, use an eyedropper with water and drop it into a bowl of water the drop merges into the bowl and can no longer be distinguished with the bowl so the key point is that we can interact with each of these realms of vibrational reality and by learning to practice we can actually get past this subject object duality and we can begin to interact and merge the concept in shamanism called shape-shifting literally mer means to merge into either the stone the tree the falcon the the bear the big cat the squirrel and by merging in with it you can communicate with that life form or that energy form and begin to not only have a relationship with it but find out that there's levels of information experience and wisdom that your ego typically isn't at going to access or doesn't have access to because the ego is uh, a concept that leads to a subject object differentiation or a split I am in the car with you my boss pays me this much a month so there you see the split but if you were to use active imagination and instead of calling it the horns it was your boss or your friend or your lover or your mother if you relax deeply enough and allowed that image to come into you you could essentially harmonize with the vibration of the idea or the individual to the point that you might have feelings thoughts and images rise up that were not only yours but you could then confirm with that person I was while I was doing this meditation I had this feeling mom that you really were wishing you could go get your nails and your hair done and your mother might look at you and say oh my god that's all I've been thinking about lately I've been busy haven't had a time my nails are chipped my hair's got split ends how'd you know that well you see you find out this magical thing that what you think of your mother over there is really actually a part of you that in reality is not separate from you but is more like another ripple on a bigger wave called life and you're one ripple looking at another ripple or a drop looking at another drop perceiving separation so when we use a concept like a rabbit with horns we can then take the rabbit and in our imagination choose something maybe you'd put tusks on it from a rhino or a big nose on it from an elephant and then you can begin to interact with it and you say hmm if I had a rabbit that had a tusk like an elephant how would it behave differently what would it what would it do with the ability to suck up all that water and blow it would it be maybe something that I could train to water my garden that'd be cool and could it how would it defend itself what would it do with that big long nose would it whack other animals would it blow water on them would it would it build the mechanism of a skunk so it could blow stink at you um, this is just an example you you can look at the concept of the elephant and the concept of the rabbit or the concept 
of a bighorn sheep and a concept of a rabbit. So if you merge the bighorn sheep with a rabbit, how does it change the rabbit? What does it draw into itself from the bighorn sheep? And if you did the opposite, if you gave the rabbit into the bighorn sheep, how would it change it? So by sitting in within yourself in a state of quiet introspection and opening yourself to the imaginal realm and letting more than natural childlike energies come out of you, you find something interesting. While everybody else is sitting in meditation classes hoping that their mind will stop, you've got a rabbit with horns and you're having a hell of a good time. And though this goes against the common concept of meditation, really meditation is about relaxation. It's not an active process. And you'll find with active imagination, the more you relax and allow things to emerge on their own, and the more you allow yourself to relax and merge with the rabbit or merge with the elephant to talk to it and see what happens when you mix, then you begin relaxing so deeply that you have not only periods where you're giggling and laughing uh, and periods where you may be in deep thought, but then because you're engaging with your mind and you're doing it out of creativity and out of play, and out of joy, not a sense of angst, of, oh, I gotta meditate again, this damn mind of mine, you all of a sudden find that you're having these moments where you're, shall we say, being dreamed. You're not necessarily doing the dreaming. All of a sudden you find out that maybe that rabbit with horns is dreaming you. And you learn to uh, giggle and have fun and relax, and then you will be sitting there maybe thinking, hmm, my rabbit with horns, what else could I do to enhance my rabbit with horns and maybe create a rabbit that's even better for the environment? Maybe a rabbit with horns that loves to eat toxins and can transform them magically. So you might be at a point where you're thinking, hmm, what do I do with this rabbit next? And then you, shall we say, put out your feelers. You just relax and, and close your eyes and instead of working so hard to go try to investigate like you're writing a school report, what I do is I just wait for the idea to come to me. You know, the spider builds a web and waits for the food to come. So most people in meditation are, are shall we say, um, building the web and then filling it full of thoughts because that's the background buzz. But if you give the mind an activity that is playful and even purposeful and you say now I wonder what else I can do with my rabbit and you just relax and send that message out to the universe how could we create an even more cool rabbit that would help remove toxins from the environment then you turn your intuition on and you become an open receptacle. You have an idea that's not complete inside of you. You got the rabbit, you got the horns, but you want to know what else to add. So you can talk to the spirit of the rabbit. You could talk to the spirit of the big horn sheep. You could talk to the spirit of the elephant. You could even talk to the spirit of a forest. Remember, this is all imaginal. And then wait for them to talk back to you, which is very, very exciting. And it's kind of like when you're talking to somebody on the phone and you just finished your sentence and you're waiting for them to respond. There's often a natural pause and we expect that natural pause. And because we're listening, you'll find if you pay attention, you're listening. If you're truly listening, there's nothing going through your head, which means you're actually meditating in that moment. Sometimes your mind's trying to project what they're going to say, which is a, a habit that you you know, learn to let go of and be truly present. But in that moment, you're actually meditating. So when you're asking the universe or the mountains or the rabbits or the elephants or whatever you've requested help from, just like you're listening on the phone, you go into this state of open receptivity. And because there's a question inside of you, interestingly, you've created the illusion that there's something missing in you. And the illusion that there's something missing is something that the universe likes to fill because the universe itself is whole. 
So wherever there's, you know, there's a, an old saying in science, nature abhors a vacuum. Wherever there's nothing, shall we say, uh, the universe or consciousness wants to put something in there because the nature of creation is fullness. It's, as paradoxically, is also emptiness. So this really is a fun process. Uh, I'll give you a quick example of, of a situation in my own life, which there's many, but when I was a young man, probably 19, I worked in, on an exploration and water well drilling crew, and we were doing a very deep well and some very tough drilling territory with rocky ground and areas with shale and, and washaways and all sorts of technical drilling stuff, but we had a shift in the earth and it pinched one of our drill rods and when we were trying to back up to, to bring the rod back up to do some servicing work on the bit or whatever, it unscrewed the drill rod and we're about 1500 feet down in the earth. So it's very hard when you cannot see something 12 or 1500 feet down to figure out how do you get the threads from the pipe that just broke off back in when the hole can be washed out and the pipe can be anywhere. So it's a very tricky, potentially challenging situation because you can lose the drill rod, lose the bit and a lot of technical stuff. So the crew uh, basically came to a standstill and was going to make some phone calls to potentially hire a special team to come in or get special tools to try to recover this very expensive drill rod and bit. I was the new guy on the crew and I didn't feel like riding to town, something inside of me said, you can solve this problem. So I sat there on the end of the drill rig with my feet in the mud, the drilling mud, looking down the hole, and I begin to imagine that I was traveling down the hole. Uh, I just took my consciousness down the hole and I could see the rod and the contour, and sure enough, I got down there where I could see the end of the rod and I could see the other rod had leaned to the side so every time we tried to pick it up we couldn't pick it up. Now these guys were gone for quite a while. It was a big bummer because it can be a very expensive process to recover a rod like this and we were on a deadline and I had a vision come to me and the vision that I had was of a bell on top of the rod that we were in control of and if I could create a bell and I could move it really slowly, if I could even just catch the edge of that drill rod, the bell would be like a funnel, it would push it right back up and we could seat the threads and pull it up again. So, taking the risk that I could do this, I began drill, uh, using our acetylene, oxyacetylene torch and I took some flat metal and cut it into sections and I welded together what looked like a, a light shade on a light and created what looked like a bell at the end of a drill rod so we could send it down. And sure enough, you know, the crew thought, well, we got nothing to lose. So when they came back, I already had this thing all welded up and ready to go. And they liked the idea and we had nothing to lose. So sure enough, we sent it down there. It took us a couple of hours just to get all the rods up and then back down again to put that bell down and what I did was just slowly turned I just used my intuition as to what pace I should turn the drill rod by controlling the motors on the drilling rig and sure enough I felt it touch and then I kept moving and slowly it wound up and we got the thing back and it was quite a you know an exciting celebration on the crew because it saved us you know many many thousands of dollars and a lot of time so early on in my youth, I was doing this kind of active imagination for problem solving, and it's been a, a very, very beneficial skill to me. It has helped me develop a lot of the methods that I, are, are, I share in the Czech Institute training programs of all types, and I encourage all of you to know that you don't have to work so hard at meditation as a concept of trying to stop your mind but that there's a tremendous amount of fun in using active imagination, i.e. a rabbit with horns, and that when you love what you're doing and you allow your mind to work freely, 
it naturally comes to these rest points and those rest points are easiest to achieve whenever you are looking for something or have a concept, i.e. how do I get the drill rod out of the ground and the bit or how do I solve this relationship problem or how do I grow my business or what should I um, you know, seek as the ideal product line, the list is infinite really. With that emptiness and that passion and that active engagement, it's as natural to rest your mind when you're seeking the next link in the connections that you're trying to create as it is to rest at the end of a hard set in the gym. Most people have no problem resting at the end of a hard set in the gym, especially if you're really doing some hard training. You pay attention to what your mind does after you do a heavy set of squats or deadlifts or lunges and you're just cooked. And you sit down and if you are aware, you'll find your mind is often going into this emptiness and it's as though you're there but not there. So if you give your mind permission to rest and realize that it's when it's resting, it's actually in its receptive mode, right? Think of it, your mind is like a sponge. If you're resting, the sponge has something it can absorb. But if your mind is thinking, that's like squeezing the sponge. So if you keep squeezing the sponge, you can't draw anything into it. You're pushing everything out of it. So if you think of your mind like that sponge and use activities that exercise it, but also open yourself to the creative impulse of receiving information, then becoming like a sponge means you get to be receptive. And the exciting part is, is that you start getting all sorts of cool answers and images and you go, wow, I didn't think of that. And so what you realize is the rest of you is involved in all of you and the mind loves to think and the mind obviously loves to feel because we have feelings and values, which is astral, and we need a physical body or something physical to engage with. So it becomes a, a really fun, magical process that in my experience has led to deeper and deeper periods of, shall we say, absorption, which is meditation in the classical sense. So let's just look at a couple key distinctions here of things that will help you with this. One, we tend to believe our thoughts as concrete realities. She loves me or she loves me not. Remember, your thoughts are not just your thoughts. Your thoughts are the strawberries thoughts that you ate. That strawberry is inside of you. Your thoughts are the beef thoughts, the chicken thoughts. Uh, your thoughts are all those in your ancestral lineage. So, uh, be careful with believing your thoughts because your thoughts really are very narrowly encapsulated expressions of energy which often come with the illusion of separation from the other. Instead of saying she loves me or she loves me not, you could simply use the principle of active imagination and get rid of any judgment and just be fully present with the person that you're inquiring about no matter where they're at in the world and feel what rises up in you. But you have to be brave enough to let go of your own judgments and you have to be brave enough to find out that maybe she doesn't love me, which might be ideal instead of waiting another two years and playing two more years of games. And then you could simply go share. I was meditating and I connected to you and I had this feelings that maybe you're sad about something or whatever. And the next thing you know, you're finding out the truth, but you found it out like a shaman did. You connected to that person, not as external to you, but as internal to you. Okay. So the tip here is don't believe your thoughts necessarily. Always question them. Is it really true? And what do I feel? And am I brave enough to connect to this so fully that my rabbit with horns becomes real? And now I can have a relationship with it. Much of our challenge comes from passive programming versus active conditioning of your mind. Most of the thoughts racing through people's heads are really the reverberations of things they've been told, things they see on television, things they read, and most of them are based on fearful thoughts. That's passive conditioning of the mind, which is again why it's important to question your thoughts and do what I call flipping the coin. Every is has an equal and opposite isn't, and if you don't explore the isn't, then you really 
have uh, the danger of experiencing one-sided thinking, which is not very holistic. By going into these active ima imagination processes, where a person who is in typical meditation, instead of stabilizing their mind, they're usually getting frustrated that their mind, frustrated that their mind's jumping all over the place, and that causes emotion and frustration, and they feel like, oh, I'm not doing a very good job, and the, the, the long list of judgments comes, and then, oh, I'm not going to meditate. You know, it leads to all sorts of challenges. But when you're using active imagination, then you're actually really engaging in the process, and therefore it's a positive use of the mind, it's a focused use of the mind, and you're really out there hunting. You know, what do I want to add to this rabbit to make it more cool? So that's actually exercising your mind, just like you exercise your body, but through the practice of letting the whole universe participate, you the earth or the rabbits or the elephants or whatever it might be, or the drill rod in the hole, you begin to do what's called stabilizing a vantage point. And if you're in that dreaming realm, you're in the subtle realm. A shaman is someone who can stabilize the vantage point and actually work it and answer questions and find solutions to a wide variety of situations. So the point here is most of the challenges people have in meditation is from passive programming, which means stuff that was put into them without their conscious awareness that's still bubbling up in the background, running like old record players going forever and ever. But you can rise above that by active engagement and becoming part of a process that is either purely for creativity or, as I described with the drill rod situation, uh, shall we say, creative application of imagination to a real problem. And therefore, you find yourself sitting on the end of a drill rig meditating while covered in mud and getting paid for it. Okay. Creative problem solving means we got to get outside of the box. Einstein, you, Stein, Einstein said you cannot solve a problem with the same thinking that created it, which is very, very true. So there's nothing better than learning to get outside of the box than putting a set of horns on a rabbit. <laughs> That's out of the box, baby. Um, you know, uh, maybe you're a young man and you can design the perfect woman. How many boobs would she have? Uh, what would you add to her to make her even more sexy? You know, would she have an insty sex button or, you know, play with it? Okay. Um, with the emergence of artificial intelligence, you might come up with a new addition. Uh, inventive capability, I talked about that. It's very powerful for um, inventive endeavors. Uh, I am an inventor with multiple patents, and I know how to use these techniques for inventing things, and you can invent your life, right? The number one thing I keep sharing with all my students and everybody in my one, two, three, four, four formula is what is your dream? Well, that means what do you want to invent out of yourself? You can become anything and anyone you want to. The only limitation on that is your own beliefs. Right? Remember, there were little boys that woke up and said to their mommy when they were seven, I want to be the president of the United States and did it. I want to be a gold medalist in the Olympics and did it. The, the world is chock-a-block with books on all these true stories of people that did this thing. So really, the first thing you got to do is invent yourself. And if you don't like the situation you have right now, hey, reinvent yourself. Don't wait till you're in some doctor's office getting put on antidepressants to reinvent yourself because those drugs don't make this process easier. They lock you down here into the physical and actually make you start believing in your problems, which gives you a rabbit with lots of horns and prickles and shit that is hard to get out of you. Okay? Interactive meditation I've described. This is a neat one. The subject, object, and perception. What you find is if I'm talking to you, I am the subject, I'm speaking to you, you're the object, okay? So if I say, I love my wife, I'm saying, I love subject. My wife is the recipient, she becomes the object, or you could say the I and the thou. I love my wife, she's the thou of the I, okay? Now, we normally 
perceive ourselves from the position of the subject whenever we're relating to any other person, place, or thing. But that creates a, a perpetual experience of duality. Now, watch this. If I create a rabbit with horns, and you could, I would recommend drawing these things too, because that opens your creativity up even more, and you uh, exercise new elements of yourself. It doesn't have to be beautiful. I just scratch that thing up. I mean, that's about as good as I draw or paint right there, and I love it. So if I create this rabbit with horns, then I might say to it, you are so cool. What do you do with those great big horns? And now I have to sit and wait and hold my attention on this rabbit, which is an image in my psyche. And lo and behold, the rabbit says, well, I defend the carrot patch so I can have all the carrots I want. It's hard to keep some of these big animals out of here. The deer want to come eat it, but when they see a rabbit with horns, it freaks them out and they usually just run away. Okay. Now, something just happened because the rabbit was the object. I was imagining my rabbit and I asked it a question. But when the rabbit talks back to me, I become the subject and the rabbit is thinking it's the subject. So I've just inverted the subject-object relationship. Well, holy schmoly. If you can invert the subject-object relationship, and have an experience like that that is as real as me talking to you right now, and I do this all the time, you have a big question to ask. What is really real? Who is really who? How is that rabbit talking to me if I'm sitting there listening and I'm not doing the talking? This brings up some really paradoxical realities, and this really is what spirituality is all about. Spirituality is like finding out what's really going on in the world. What's the truth behind all these illusions? Well, the truth is that all of it is you. Every bit of it. Everything you see around you is you. What you call God, for example, you call God such and such, you've made God an object. God is this. God wants that. God only believes in these practices. God says you have to circumcise your kid. No, God says you shouldn't. Now you've created a rabbit with horns. The difference is, is you keep reading books and believing what other people say about it. And so the paradox of it is, is that you've actually created a God or believed in a God through passive programming in most cases. But what you find out is that the word God means wholeness. If God is God, then God has to be not only the source, but the sum of everything. So now you can come to a strange and, and mind-boggling realization that the subject is the object, and the object is the subject. God is me, and I am God. God is we, and we are God. God is it. And it is God. Now that removes a lot of the need for being told what to do, confusion about scripture, and brings you into a deep and profound experience, which can come from a rabbit with horns, that if the subject-object split can be reversed, then so can everything in the entire universe and the concept of me being separate from the mountain is reversible. And lo and behold, if you meditate on or become present with a mountain or a tree or anything, you can become so one with it that you actually experience yourself as a tree and can have moments of complete loss of your perception of your ego self as the person experiencing the tree. So at the end of the day, you find out that it's all active imagination. <laughs> And that's what the Hindu scriptures call Maya, the grand illusion. It's all active imagination or a virtual reality. And since it is a virtual reality, then we are the Walt Disney and the Steven Spielberg of our own lives. We pay people like Steven Spielberg and Walt Disney to look at their active imaginations. And we think it's amazing. But then when we tell people we're doing stuff like that, they think we're silly. But remember, the, some of the most successful 
uh, people who have done the most to enrich our lives with entertainment are the people that engaged in this process fully and sold it to you as a product. So that's my little lesson on a rabbit with horns. And I will thank Thich Nhat Hanh for inspiring me to use that concept to show you uh, another way of engaging active imagination. If you want some resources or some tips, number one, have fun. If it's not fun, you're not going to engage in it. Another tip is if you're around people that are too boxed in and too narrow-minded, well, don't tell them what you're doing because it just makes your life more miserable. Some things are best kept inside. Be creative. Remember, what does your rabbit next need, right? What, what would the... What would make the rabbit even more cool for whatever it is that you want your imaginary rabbit to do? He told you he wanted the horns to protect the carrot patch, which means he wants to eat. Unwind first. You'll find these methods, all meditation or active imagination methods, are better done in a state of unwinding. So if you're doing it at the end of the day, you've got a lot of stress on your head, you've been busy, you got, you know, a lot of buzz in you then find something that you can do. I encourage people to use an activity that matches the level of wind-up that they have. Tai Chi or Qigong or breathing exercises might sound fine, but if you just got too much buzz on you, you might be better to go out in the backyard and knock out as many push-ups as you can, do some jumping jacks, do some sit-ups, mountain climbers, swing a kettlebell, whatever you got. Push yourself to the point where you've used about as much energy as it takes to make you want to rest. Then, maybe do a few minutes of breathing exercises, and when you come down, then you get rid of all the background buzz, then your imaginative faculties and your inner vision starts to get much more vivid because your power is not being divided by all of these gotta do, woulda done, shoulda, coulda done, he said, she said, screw this blah 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 type activity okay there's work in exercises in my book how to eat move and be healthy and those work in exercises are called zone exercise and i show you how to use those exercises which can be beautifully coupled with an active imagination for things like healing my digestion so i visualize my digestive system as healthy and seeing food moving through it and dissolving and filling me with its magical energy so active imagination I use regularly in healing work with people, and it's very powerful. So unwind, work in, tips and eat, move and be healthy. Once you've calmed yourself down, begin your fun process of active imagination as a form of meditation, what we might call dynamic meditation. Notice the effects of drink and diet on your body-mind. Having been meditating for most of my life, my mother became a yogi when I was 12. I was trained by the monks in summer camp when I was not only 15, but went to uh, the Self-Realization Fellowship Temple most every weekend from age 12 all the way till about uh, 16. So I've had a lot of time to experiment. I can tell you, you know, if you're drinking soda pop or eating too much sugar or taking various medical drugs or eating too much animal flesh, or too much vegetables, any imbalance in your biochemistry has a direct effect on your emotional and mental stability. So if you take up a practice like active imagination and do it regularly, and all of a sudden notice you're having a hard time really bringing up your image, you might say, wow, what did I eat or drink today and how well did I sleep or just think of the four doctors, quiet diet, movement and happiness, am I stressed out, am I doing things I love to do, am I getting enough rest and I'm eating well? Sure enough, typically one or two stress factors came. Oh yeah, I didn't have time to eat today. I was in a rush, so I ate snack bars all day. Well, what do you find out? That's affecting you. Or, you know, I didn't bring enough to eat, so I ate peanuts all day, and now my mind's all over the place. Well, there you go. So know that your body and your mind are actually two components of, of one process, just like heads and tails are part of one coin. But since you need to fuel your body and keep it alive, the body's a vibrational entity, so everything you put into it has a vibrational resonance that's either harmonious or inharmonious with you at that time. 
So learning how to have a relationship with yourself so you can enhance your um, active imagination or creative process or mental, create mental stability can help you in all aspects of your life. And my book, How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy, and my last four doctors book gives you mountains of information. And my HLC1 program takes you a big step further in mastering all those practices. So there's plenty you can do. And then ground yourself with my four doctor concepts, the last four doctors will ever need. Get clear on what your dream is so you know why you're engaging in meditation, active imagination, exercise, sleeping well, caring for yourself. What's the direction you're headed? What are you producing out of yourself? Or you live passively and just become um, a contributor to the rich people's pockets as you dwindle into the doldrums of anxiety and depression and my life is meaningless and nobody loves me and God is scary and all that stuff. And then finally, PPS Success Mastery Lesson 1 is how to find and live your legacy, which means your life dream. And I take you through a process in there of looking into yourself to see where you're holding on to old trapped energy, pains, resents, fear. I show you a little bit how to identify how much of this comes from parental programming so you can rise above it and become your true self. I show you how to look at the challenges in your life from a more holistic perspective so you can see the beauty behind it. And I show you how a dream has 10 key components and what components you need to be consciously aware of in the creation of your current dream or your life's dream and which ones you need more information so you can do the same thing. If you know where you want to be, you know how much money you want to make, you know how much, what kind of people you want to be with, but you're not sure what you want to do, you've now got three components of the puzzle. And just like any puzzle, if you have a piece of a puzzle and it shows lips, you know somewhere nearby there is two pieces that have jaw lines on them. So you start looking around for the jawline pieces and next thing, oh, got that, now I need a neck. Oh, I need some hair. Well, right, a box of a thousand pieces, you're gonna find what you're looking for by knowing what pieces you already have. So PPS lesson one is really a very, very powerful lesson for a person to learn to identify what it is that would nourish their soul, what makes them feel good, what direction you wanna go and therefore how to consciously direct your energies into the things that you want and learn to let go of the things that are from the past that are holding you back from achieving your dreams and being fully present in the moment. So there you go. All that from a rabbit with horns. I hope you enjoy this active imagination process. I hope you enjoy a little Paul Check approach to meditation that's not quite so typical out there and one that has worked very, very well for me since I was very, very young and gives me tremendous reward. And another tip for you is I find these practices easier to do in a sauna or a steam room. So when you get warm enough and you calm down, you can relax and the mind flowers really nicely or a hot bath with some mineral salts and um, maybe you can get some Moldavite mineral salts, which help open the creative psyche. Thanks for joining me. I will look forward to sharing something with you soon. Hopefully I'll see you in HLC1 or hear your beautiful voice on a PPS coaching call, which you get access to for a good period of time. Anytime you buy even one of my lessons, look forward to talking to you soon. Enjoy active, uh, excuse me, enjoy active imagination.